There we go. Okay. Do I need to start over? Where? No, it's fine. I think you guys heard me, so it was good. Okay. So the actual Louisiana base of the Whoopi International Crane Foundation is only three years old, which is really interesting, but I can already see in those years so much good has happened and likely will absolutely continue. Um, so sort of the idea behind this conversation was really inspired by a creative connection that Irvin made between the story of the Whoopi and Crane and the story of the Acadians and their um, migration paths and their different, um, the context that they have found themselves here agriculturally um, and beyond. So I thought that was a really fantastic connection with our George Rodrigue exhibition that we have at the moment. And if you haven't checked it out on the back wall, there is a series of paintings called The Saga of the Acadians. And um, I absolutely recommend that. Additionally, the other three exhibitions we have also have a strong nature theme. So it just so happens that this is just spring nature season. And uh, the final note that I'll add is that this Saturday we will be planting um, a pollinator garden here at the Hilliard as part of an effort to think not only about our location within the arts community, but within our ecosystem more broadly in Louisiana. So plants that were part of the original Cajun prairie, um, we will have over 14 species planted here. Um, and we can watch their process and as they grow. So it is my pleasure to welcome Brittany and Irvin. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming. And I really look forward to this presentation. Thank you for having us at this, uh, at the Hilliard Art Museum. And um, yeah, we really wanted to uh, share the connections between whooping cranes and the Cajun story as well. And uh, at least as I characterize it in my head at least, um, it's stories of adaptation, loss, and recovery. Um, so the International Crane Foundation works all around the world to conserve cranes and the watersheds and flyways on which they depend, and that includes uh, to a large degree, Louisiana as well, where we do a lot of outreach work um, and work with our partners on the ground to conserve cranes uh, more directly. Um, so I do want to preface this with saying that I'm not a historian or an expert in uh, Cajun culture or Cajun history. Um, I am of Cajun heritage, and it's just something that I'm personally invested in and proud of, and also I've been doing a lot of research in over the last few years, especially as I try to kind of reconnect with my roots. Um, but I have these maps up to kind of show the widespread um, voyages and migrations of, of the Acadians and, and then later known as Cajuns, as well as the migration routes of whooping cranes across North America. And uh, you can see kind of the, the lighter colors on the map uh, to, the, to the right show whooping cranes in their historical range and how much that shrunk over time even though they were once quite widespread, it's shrunk down to a much smaller area. Um, but in, in the recent two decades or so, we're seeing them kind of grow, reclaim some of those areas, as well as reclaim some new areas. Um, so in Acadia, as you can see, some, some of which in the Rodrigue exhibit, uh, the Acadians settled some of the coastal marshes in Nova Scotia, or what is now Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, uh, Prince Edward Island. Um, and they tended to settle the marshes um, along the Bay of Fundy and other areas like that. And if you're familiar with the Bay of Fundy, you may know that um, the tides can fluctuate very wildly. Um, so low tide and high tide would be a difference of about 30 to 40 feet in some places. Um, so those tides covered a lot of area, both mudflats and marshes. And so the Acadians, who it's theorized may have t taken some knowledge from Western France where they were um, using dikes to harvest salt from the ocean, um, took that knowledge into Acadia and made dikes to um, hold back the tide, basically. And these dikes let fresh water out so they weren't retaining water like you might see in crawfish fields today in Louisiana. Um, and all of that was to let the fields become more fresher and not at have lower salinity so that they could actually grow crops there. Um, while it was still kind of salty in the early years, they grazed a lot there, and then once it became fresh enough, they did plant wheat and oats and other, other you know, crops of that, of that area to try, and corn, uh, just to feed their families and their communities. Um, meanwhile, in Canada, whooping cranes have their own, uh, that's predominantly their breeding region, and so they're uh, breeding in freshwater marshes, eating a lot of freshwater 
um, invertebrates, dragonfly larvae and things. And um, yeah, this is a picture of whooping cranes nesting at Wood Buffalo National Park um, in northern Canada. Um, but historically, they nested over much of central and uh, central Canada and into the northern U.S. Um, once Acadians did come to Louisiana, they had to adapt. Um, I'm not going to cover a whole lot of the deportation. I think that's covered by Rodrigue, and I'm certainly not an expert in that. So I'm going to focus a little bit more in Louisiana, as that's a place I'm from as well. Um, but when Acadians did come to Louisiana, they had to adapt uh, to the, the local ecosystem. This is a picture of women finding crabs. Um, and agriculturally, they adapted as well. They transitioned from growing more wheat and oats and those cooler weather crops into growing corn and rice, transitioned from, sweet pota or from potatoes to sweet potatoes, which is in the picture to the right, and transitioned, um, as uh, one of the museums in town uh, says at least, transitioned from maple syrup into corn syrup. Um, so just a different ecosystem, and they learned to live with what they had and learn from the people that, that were already here. When they came to Louisiana, they also encountered cranes for the first time. Um, so in Louisiana, at that time, we had sandhill cranes and whooping cranes. Um, quite large populations of whooping cranes. We don't know the exact numbers because it's kind of pre-records, um, but we we know that we had wintering and breeding whooping cranes and sandhill cranes in Louisiana, possibly into the hundreds or maybe even thousands, um, at least in the winter. Um, kind of in this uh, prairie and coastal marshes of southwest Louisiana. Now, Cajuns were in these areas and also in areas further east, but I'm going to focus on these areas because that's where cranes were as well. Um, Cajuns weren't the first people to encounter cranes in Louisiana, however. Um, Native Americans from archaeological digs, we know, um, we found whooping crane ulnas fashioned into whistles, um, both from about 1250 AD up to about 1800 AD. Um, and these were found both in coastal Texas and coastal Louisiana. The ones with the green background were found in Cameron Parish. Um, the older ones tended to be very ornately fashioned with a lot of uh, markings on them, and the later ones tended to be a little bit more plain. Um, and we don't know exactly how they used them, um, but from archaeological digs of refuse pits and other things, we can, we, we can infer that they didn't use whooping cranes as food um, because we do find lots of um, deer and fish bones and things like that there, and we don't find whooping crane bones just tossed away. These were buried with people. So we think that whooping cranes were probably revered in some form or fashion, but we really don't know more than that. Um, however, we do know a little bit about what Cajuns and uh, European settlers thought of whooping cranes. So in the 1940s, John Lynch, who is a um, biologist who studied whooping cranes in Louisiana and found the first uh, scientifically documented breeding pairs in the state, um, interviewed uh, old, old timers who grew up in the marshes, grew up around whooping cranes, and here are some of the things that they said about them. They knew that whooping cranes were eating crawfish, their nests were three to five feet wide, they always laid two eggs, they were usually seen in pairs in all seasons, that they were very wary. Um, they liked to eat sprouted corn, but they didn't eat the crops as much as sandhills did. Um, and notably, they felt that it was bad luck to harm a white crane which is a sentiment we see not just in Louisiana, but also in other parts of the world, where people live near cranes. Um, they tend to, re tend to respect cranes quite a bit, as, as would I with a, crane, a bird that's five feet tall, almost as tall as I am. You kind of give those bigger species a wide berth. And so those were some things that Cajuns um, reported as their thoughts. And these were people that grew up around them but didn't necessarily see them later in life. Um, similar, or in, in Louisiana, uh, Cajuns in, later in the, eight, in the 1900s um, experienced loss of the
crawfish and rice in the same fields at different times of the year. Uh, this was a picture taken, I don't know when exactly, anywhere from the 70s to the 90s, uh, by George Archibald, um, the International Green Foundation's co-founder um, of the Louisiana crawfish um, landscape, I guess. And um, crawfish, had, by that time, had become a pretty big industry, and fortunately, whooping grains and crawfish actually coexist quite well. Um, just the timing of the flood works out, and creates a lot of nesting habitat and foraging habitat for whooping cranes. Um, and crawfish industry continues to go strong today. Um, this year is a little bit of a down year with the drought we had last year, but in general, um, there's several hundred acres of crawfish being grown in Louisiana, or several hundred thousand acres of, of crawfish being grown in Louisiana every year, uh, providing habitat for cranes and abundant water birds. Um, and similarly with whooping cranes, not all was lost. Although we lost our population in Louisiana, there were cranes that continued to persist, uh, migrating between uh, Wood Buffalo National Park in Canada down to Aransas. We'll talk more about those, but for now, um, through captive breeding, we were able to start releasing birds into Louisiana again in 2011. Um, and within my own life, I've, I've, been, I've Learned a lot more about our, our local ecosystem, learned how to use plants medicinally like passion vine and monglier, learned how to dye some Easter eggs with native plants. That's my attempt last year anyway, I'll try to do better this year. Um, and some vegetables as well. Um, and just other aspects of trying to live off of our little, little plot of land in Lafayette, growing collards and raising chickens and all that kind of thing. Um, just trying to add to my own knowledge of my own heritage and just kind of how to live on this landscape. And whooping cranes are doing something similar. So this was actually a, we don't know if they're a pair yet, but it's two young adult whooping cranes, possibly to become a pair, um, who are wild hatched. They're unbanded, we don't know their identities. And um, hopefully in a few years, uh, they'll be raising chicks of their own. But in the meantime, we know that these birds were raised out on the landscape learn how to be cranes from their parents who were raised in captivity, um, but they learn on this landscape. And future generations that are raised by them, hopefully, uh, will continue to be raised on this landscape and know even better how to be cranes in Louisiana. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague Brittany and she'll share a little bit more information about how whooping cranes came to be in Louisiana. So yeah, as Urban mentioned, I'm going to be telling you guys about our Louisiana population of the whooping cranes that we have now. How did these guys get back to Louisiana? What did that process look like? How is our current population looking and what is the future of our Louisiana population looking like too? Uh, so before we get to mention that, I always like to point out um, some birds that people do kind of get confused for whooping cranes or birds that might look a little bit similar because um, they're white birds. So those two pictures that you see at the top, those are actually whooping cranes. Um, that picture at that bottom left-hand corner is a great egret, and the picture at the right bottom corner is going to be a great blue heron. So there are a lot of differences between those birds. If you look at those whooping crane images, you can tell that's a pretty big bird. So whooping cranes stand about five feet tall, so a little bit shorter than me. And our birds that are towards that bottom, they might average around three feet. So they're going to be those smaller birds that you'll see. With our whooping cranes, they, these guys have different foraging behaviors than the birds at the bottom. So our whooping cranes are going to be active foragers and active predators. So you're going to see them kind of how that image is on the top left. They're going to be walking around on the ground with those necks down, searching for food, searching for um, some of those plant tubers, um, searching for crawfish, some of the blue crab that uh, Irvin mentioned in Texas. So they're going to be really active searching um, for their food. Now our birds at the bottom are more ambush predators, so they're very stealthy. You'll see them go in with prestigious accuracy um, target for targeting uh, those predators. So that's a little bit how their food's different. Um, some other things that they have are just adaptations to their bodies that you guys might be able to see as well. Um, our whooping cranes do not perch in trees. They don't have that foot anatomy for that. So their back toe is really short. 
Um, the birds at the bottom have a longer back toe that's going to allow them to grasp those branches and allow them to perch and nest in the trees. So our whooping cranes don't do that. So you're going to see those guys on the ground for sure. Our whooping cranes also have some contrasting wing tips. So in this picture at the very top uh, right corner, you're seeing those black wing tips on the whooping cranes. Easily can tell it from the white feathers. Um, so that's your whooping cranes there. Beautiful colors on those wings. Now our birds at the bottom, those egrets and those herons, um, those guys are going to have a consistent color throughout their feathers. Um, so those are a couple ways you can tell them apart just by looking too. Our whooping cranes also are usually in a family group. So you might see a mother, a father, and a juvenile with them. Or you might see a mated pair together. Um, so they do kind of run in the flock and in family groups. But when you're looking about your herons or your egrets, they don't necessarily do that. You might see them in the same field together, um, but they're not hanging out with a specific individual um, unless they are nesting or breeding. So that's a little ways you might tell them apart. And if you do see these guys, um, our herons and our egrets, they might be in your ditches too. Um, you can get pretty close to those guys and they are quite quiet. Our whooping cranes, you won't be able to sneak up on them at all. <laughs> they will know you are there and they will let you know that they know that you're there. Um, so that's just some ways that you can tell those guys apart and a couple differences that they have. loss and also shooting some of these birds, those things that happened back in the 1940s and 50s, uh, we have seen a loss of a lot of our whooping cranes. So there were about 20 of them left out in the wild around those 40s and 50s, and they were reduced to a singular flyway. So that red box there is showing you that's why what these guys were reduced to. Um, so the gray area at the very top is uh, Wood Buffalo National Park in Canada. So that's where those guys would breed at. And then they would winter down um, in Texas at Aransas National Wildlife Refuge. And so they were reduced to this one singular flyway. So you can see that detrimental uh, effect that a lot of the stuff that we did back in the day have done to these birds. But when this happened, there was a lot of push for conservation for these birds. A lot of people wanted to see these birds again. You know, there wasn't a lot of regulation for hunting back then until we realized like these these birds are in singular digits, getting down to singular digits or double digits, so we needed to do something. So there were a lot of conservation movements that occurred, a lot of acts that were put into place to help save these birds. Um, so this is just an example of a U.S. Postal Service uh, stamp that was created in 1957 just to create awareness for whooping cranes, to get people uh, in the know about the population, how these guys are doing, and how they're extremely endangered at that time. So what did we do to help these guys? How do we help this population? So we wanted to create a captive breeding program. Urban talked about it just a little bit, uh, but this was around the 60s to the 90s. It's the program that started where they would go into the nest of whooping cranes, the ones that were nesting in Canada, and they would take one egg for the purpose of bringing it back to a captive facility, breeding it there, and then eventually be able to release those chicks out into the habitat. So that's how that program started. So whooping cranes will usually lay about two eggs in their nest when they are breeding, uh, but it is very natural for both of those eggs might hatch, uh, but it's natural for one of those chicks to actually die off. So us actually coming in, taking those eggs out of those nests and tear, uh, taking care of them um, in captivity was really helpful for the population. So they did that for about 30 years, the 60s to the 90s, and then we started getting the population in the captive breeding facilities. We didn't have to do that any longer. So we're basically relying on the captive birds to produce chicks for us that we can release out. So after you get those birds, or after you get those eggs, you have to send them off to facilities. There's a lot of facilities, a lot of captive breeding facilities that we actually work with and that in collaboration with each other um, so that we can make this possible. And our efforts were to get whooping cranes back into those habitats that they used to inhabit, back to those historical ranges. And that's why Louisiana was considered as one of the, the places. So that's how we got our population started. So this is actually an image from Audubon Species Survival Center, who was one of the partners um, that helps with our captive breeding program that's going on here. Uh, and these are some of those pens that our whooping cranes would be kept in. 
Um, so you can see some little cranes on the right side of that image there too. So they are very well netted, um, and it is isolated uh, from everybody. So there's not many people that can go back there unless you have clearance or access to it. Um, it's further from roads, so you can't drive by and peek over and actually see a little crane here. So it is pretty isolated for those guys. So this image here just shows you some of the areas or some of the facilities and organizations that are in partnership um, to do these captive uh, breeding programs and also to release these birds out into the wild. So the star at the very top there um, is Canada, so that's in Calgary Zoo. Calgary Zoo is one of the partners that we have. Um, we'll go right over here to Wisconsin, and that is International Crane Foundation, our headquarters, um, does a lot of captive breeding there. Um, if you go down to Texas, one of our partners is Dallas Zoo. So these guys help out a lot as well. Down in Louisiana, we have the Audubon Species Survival Center. In Florida, there is the White Oak Conservation Center. And the two that are pretty close to each other, um, you have the Tuxent Wildlife Research Center um, in Maryland, who was very, very helpful, one of our key players at the beginning of the breeding process. Uh, they don't do it any longer, uh, but they were definitely a key player in getting this uh, started. And the next uh, spot you see over there in Virginia is going to be your Smithsonian Biological Institute. So all these facilities together are the reason why we're able to have some of these birds in Louisiana. So what does it look like after they got those eggs out of the wild, bring them into these facilities, what do they do with those chicks once they hatch? And it looks a little something like this. These chicks are absolutely adorable. I love this picture so much. <laughs> but our biologists, our scientists, our researchers, they want to make sure they disguise themselves and look as much of a crane as possible. So they're gonna have basically all white on. They don't wanna look like a human. They want these cranes to be able to say, hey, that might be a woman crane. That's what that looks like. Um, so they will have this all white suit and they also have a crane puppet that you can see there. It kind of has those similar features and uh, characteristics that whooping crane adults have. And these biologists feed these birds, um, look after them, take care of them, make sure they're growing. And they can get really good eyes on each individual bird um, whenever they're doing this. So it's really helpful for those guys. Now we definitely don't want these birds imprinted on humans, so that's why we do the whole costume rearing. Uh, I do have a pretty cool story to tell you about that afterwards, so we'll get to that in just a second. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So this is our isolated rearing facility at the International Crane Foundation. Uh, and you can see, <laughs> we have a little chick here who's pretty interested in the camera, <laughs> but he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know there's human there. Um, and so that's our biologist there too, standing in the back, um, taking care of these birds and they will definitely feed them with a puppet as well. But one of the uh, pros to actually doing the captive rearing is that you can rear several chicks at a time. So if this was a whooping crane out in the wild, we talked about them laying two eggs and possibly one of those chicks actually surviving. So they can't really take care of the chicks at that time. But having us out here doing the captive rearing, doing the costume rearing that we're doing, uh, we're able to take care of several chicks at that time. So after those chicks are about a couple months old, get into that juvenile age, uh, depending on the location of where they were in those facilities that we have, that we have um, they will be shipped down to Louisiana. So this is an image of these guys that are actually on a plane, so they're gonna fly down to Louisiana, and they are in these nice boxes that are pretty much whooping crane size <laughs> for those guys. So it is a lot that goes into bringing these guys here to Louisiana. Uh, we have a lot of partners out there. So we talked about those facilities that do the breeding for us. And we didn't talk about the aviation uh, people or the aviation companies or individuals who uh, donate their time to help fly down those birds. So when they're flown down to Louisiana, they are then picked up at the airport and then brought out to our facilities for our areas where we uh, release them. So in Louisiana, there are two areas that we've been uh, were released. And this program started in 2011. So we started uh, releasing whooping cranes into Louisiana population in 2011, and those two release sites were White Lake uh, Conservation Area and Rockefeller uh, Wildlife Refuge. So Rockefeller did have some damage from our recent hurricane, I think that was about 2018, um, so we no longer release them there, so we do have our facility um, at White Lake. So Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries does a lot of work with these whooping cranes. Um, so they're the guys that are on the ground getting them out there into the wild. So they will ship them out to the White Lake pens where they will watch them for about two weeks. Um, so it is only accessible by boat. So our biologists get on the boat with all the boxes of the whooping cranes that they have and they'll ship them on out or they'll drive one out to the area. 
So when they get there, they're going to give these guys health checks. They're going to give them a nice body check, see what their condition is. Um, is there anything that we missed before they were shipped down? Um, do their wings look normal? Are they breathing normal? We'll give them a really good check. We want to make sure that they have uh, the best chance of survival if they were to be released. They're also going to be banded. So you might be able to see on the image right here, it's got two different color bands. Um, and those bands are so that we can tell every individual apart. So when our biologists check on the bird, they know exactly what bird that is. So after they get those bands, they'll also get transmitters. So there's two types of the transmitters that uh, Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries uses for open crane. That's going to be your radio transmitters and your GPS transmitters. So the GPS transmitters are great at giving us data uh, pretty frequently. So we can get data on where these birds have been, where they've traveled over the past weeks or months or so. And the radio transmitters are mainly used when the biologists want to be out on the ground, checking in on the birds, maybe checking on their nest, so it's easy to locate them when they're out in the field. So after they get those health checks, after they get the bands, after they get the transmitters, they are then put into a top netted uh, pen. We call this a soft release. So they're not released out into the wild just yet. This is a very soft release so that they can get used to the area that they're in. So they get used to the Louisiana marshes, uh, they learn how to forage for food, they learn how to crack open crabs if they want to eat crabs, uh, they learn how to grab crawfish if they want to eat the crawfish, and some of those plant tubers that they eat. Um, so it's all about learning here. So after about two weeks, they'll leave this top netting pen, and you can probably see on this image that there's another pen or another fence on the outside there that does not have a top. So that top is removed on there, so these guys will be released into that area. So they can hang around in the marsh if they want, or they can take off, take flight, and find other habitats for them. So this image here kind of shows you some of those habitats that they have found and they really enjoy are crawfish fields <laughs> and the rice fields. They absolutely love these areas. So one thing that they provide for them is a lot of water. This water here is controlled by the farmers. So they're going to flood those fields for their rice and for their crawfish. It's a nice level for the birds here. And it offers a lot of visibility for them. So if there was a predator around, they could easily tell in those crawfish fields or in those rice fields too. They can easily tell when the predator's there. They can tell their mate, hey, something's going on. And they can defend themselves when they need to. So these are some images that I really, really love uh, that they are at some of the crawfish fields out there and some of those rice fields and our egg fields there. So the top picture you see on the left is actually a nest. So these guys have really found those fields to be the best place to be, one of the best places to be. They love the marshes too, but sometimes they'll venture out from the marshes and come to those ag fields. Uh, but that nest is made up of some vegetation that's just around the area. Um, so sometimes it might be cattails or it might be some of the uh, residual rice left over from the last year. And they're going to pack that on top of each other and they're going to have this big nest. It's about th uh, three feet wide um, and that water that they're in is maybe about 12 to 18 inches. So it's pretty ideal for this guy and it keeps those eggs pretty much high in the nest so it's away from the water. The bottom image is another one really low. That is a whooping crane that is incubating an egg, sitting on their nest while there's a farmer coming through to get his crawfish, <laughs> which is really interesting to see. You know, we talked about how we changed the landscape. You know, maybe got rid of some of those prairie lands just to make some agricultural fields and that was taken away from the habitat that whooping cranes used to use. But it's so nice to see that they're actually able to utilize that to this day. So that's what we see some of these cranes in Louisiana doing. And the image here on the right side is a beautiful, happy, healthy, <laughs> happy, healthy little crane chick. It looks very nice there with this parent coming on in at the night time. So it's lovely to see that at these park fish fields. Absolutely lovely. So when that chick is born, you see them on the nest, uh, but they are a little short. They're not as tall as their parents. So they do have to swim around in that water. So they're gonna swim and follow their parents around uh, until they get older and they'll be able to walk in that water and then eventually fly and find other habitat and other places that they want to kind of hang out in and eat. So some of the things that we're seeing where we're in a population, you know, we're seeing births, but we're also seeing deaths, unfortunately. And some of those two main causes are going to be power line collisions as well as shootings. So with power line collisions, if it might be a foggy morning and the birds want to fly off, um, it might be hard for them to see those power lines. So they're hitting those lines uh, pretty much at the last second before they can really dart off and uh, fly in a different direction. They're hitting the lines and it could cause a lot of injury and even death at those times. 
So there are some solutions we can do that help with that. We can mark those power lines. There are different uh, objects that we can use, even tags, that might swing in the wind and kind of reflect the sunlight, and that'll help these birds detect, oh, there's something there, I might want to fly a little bit higher. Um, and unfortunately, shootings are another thing that we're seeing. So shootings are very detrimental to our population. Um, you guys might have heard about a recent shooting. The USDA had made a, a statement, as well as the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries and ICF, um, about one of our recent releases into the Louisiana population. Um, our bird here was released last year and was found shot in Memu. Unfortunately, he wasn't even one year old yet, um, and it is really detrimental to these birds. It's illegal to shoot them. Uh, they are a long-lived bird, so that means that when they reach sexual maturity, it takes a while for them to get there. So when they're about three or four, that's when these guys are pretty much able to reproduce half a mile. So we need as many of them out in that population as possible to see the, those increases in numbers. So hopefully we can stop things like this from happening in the future. Now, I do have a couple of whooping cringe stories that I like to tell um, that are related to our population here in Louisiana. And one of those stories is about George Archibald and Tex. So Irvin mentioned George Archibald um, earlier. He is our co-founder of the International Crane Foundation. He is a wonderful guy. He, he is the man to know if you want to know anything about cranes. Absolutely, he's the one you want to know. Um, but he had a very special relationship with one of our whipping cranes named Tex. And I don't know if you guys have heard it before, but um, his dancing that he's done with Tex has gotten us where we are today, even with some of the birds in our population. Uh, so just a little bit of background on Tex so we can start that story too. Tex's parents um, were in the zoo and they were made it together for the hopes that they would have young that could be released out into the wild. Well, it didn't necessarily happen. These guys, they did lay eggs, they did have chicks, but all those chicks basically died until Tex in 1966. <laughs> so Tex was absolutely phenomenal coming out of that egg and being able to survive. So the zoo director at that time decided he was going to hand raise Tex at his home for about three weeks, and that's when Tex imprinted on me. So after that three week process, Tex was sent to Patuxent Wildlife Research Center in hopes that she would mate with another whooping crane so that we can use that young and put them out into the population. Well, since Tex was imprinted on humans, she did not want anything to do with other whooping cranes. Almost had defensive behavior when another whooping crane was around. But when George was around, it was the total opposite. She was dancing with George, George would dance back with her, and that's just some of that courtship behavior that whooping cranes would do. Um, so she was really excited about that. So since she failed to breed naturally with another whooping crane, they decided that they would try artificial insemination. So George built a little shack out in Texas Habitat, danced with her, spent the nights with her, got her excited, and artificial insemination uh, was actually successful. So when Tex laid her first egg, it was given to another crane pair to incubate. Um, and after two weeks, they took the egg to Campbell. So that's basically taking the egg into a darker room or a darker area, shining some light through it so you can see if there's any embryo development. And there was, there was a chick developing in there. However, the egg was a little bit formed and it was dehydrated and it was losing weight really fast. So didn't want to lose that chick at all. And there was a researcher who had an idea to hydrate the egg, put in some water for about 10 minutes and that actually worked. So the egg actually hatched into G-Wiz. So Texas' son, G-Wiz, was born, but not without his issues. He was still very, very thin. He couldn't eat on his own, he couldn't drink water on his own. So a lot of the researchers came in and two fed uh, G-Wiz. And he, when he got healthier, when he got that strength back up, he was put out in a pen with red crown cranes. So that's that species that you're seeing right there. It's got the red crown and black neck. Um, he was put out in a pen with more crane chicks so that he would imprint on them. <laughs> so no more of Tex dancing with humans. <laughs> so G Wiz was out with some more cranes. And after a while, G Wiz was brought to International Crane Foundation, where he has since been successfully hatching or successfully laying eggs, or excuse me, he's a male. <laughs> so successfully um, having chicks with another uh, living crane. Um, and those guys have He's been pretty, pretty prolific in that. A lot of the crane uh, chicks that we've had in our population have kind of been dwindling down from him. Uh, so it's really cool to see. So one of those that we really like to mention is L711. This is one of the whooping cranes in the Louisiana population. And I'll explain that name. That is the name of the bird, L711. So the L means it's in the Louisiana's population. Seven is the number of the, that chick 
in that year. So this was the seventh uh, chick to hatch that year. And that year is the 11th, so the number behind that hyphen. So L711 was the seventh chick to hatch in 2011, and it's a part of the Louisiana population. So when L711 was released, it's the very first year that we released birds into the Louisiana population. Um, L711 made it pretty soon off um, and had four chicks. So L711 was actually the first chick, or the, actually the first whooping crane in the Louisiana population to nest and have successful chicks. So she did nest in the Royals Parish there. And so these are her chicks right at the bottom there. It's about four of them that happened. Two were in um, 2021, one in 2022, and one in 2023. Um, so just to explain those names, um, you see the W behind the L, that's exactly what we're hoping that we can see in the future uh, from years on now. Um, but the, L, the LW means it's a Louisiana uh, bird that was wild hatched. So that's definitely our goal. That's what we wanted. And that was the goal the whole time um, doing the captive breeding program. So that we could have more chicks out in the wild and, um, <coughs> ooh, excuse me, and have those birds actually breeding on their own. So they don't need us anymore. That's what our hopes are for the future. So this graph here shows you our population growth that has happened um, in Louisiana. The yellow bars are how many birds that we've released that year. So in 2011, there were seven birds that were released into the population. Um, but as the years continue to go on, we released more birds. Um, but the bar that we focus on is the blue bar. So you can tell in the past couple of years, that bar has continuously started to increase. And that is the number of chicks that were wild hatched and that have fledged in the wild. And so with that increasing number, that's positive things. That's what we always want to see with this population and hopefully we'll see that in the future. So right now our population is at 81, um, and there are a couple other birds in the population that are still sitting on eggs now, um, so hopefully we'll see some chicks there too. Um, but one of the more recent updates for our population, which I love to, to show you guys, is this one. So L616 and L1617 are one of our mated pair that we have. Uh, they were the first ones to nest this year. They were the first ones to nest last year and they have successfully hatched two chicks. So these are the first two chicks that we've had for 2024. Uh, last year, they were also the first pair of whooping cranes to hatch a chick. Now last year, um, only one of those chicks did survive. Um, so that might be the case for this year. Um, we're not too sure, but hopefully we can see both of those chicks. And that red circle there is a circle around one of those chicks that we're seeing. Um, so LDWF um, did an aerial survey. And this is how they got that photo. And this is basically our whooping cranes uh, range. This is what the map looks like. This is where our whooping cranes have been. This is an older uh, map, actually. Um, it goes up to about 2021, so we are working on updating these maps. And hopefully we can get that out here uh, for you guys soon. But the yellow dots that you're seeing there are the release sites. Um, so Rockefeller and White Lake. Uh, Rockefeller doesn't do any more releases there, so it's just White Lake now. Uh, the dark blue parishes that you see are where we've been seeing active breeding active nesting of our whooping cranes. Um, there is one county, um, Jefferson County in Texas, um, that previously had a pair there nesting, but they aren't there anymore. Um, but in this map, you can also tell the light blue areas are where whooping cranes have visited. So they haven't just been staying in that one area, they've been going all over Louisiana. And as long as they have habitat that we will supply them with food, uh, shelter, things like that, we hope that they continue to do that so we can see them all over Louisiana. Um, and since this is not updated, some of those lighter blue boxes or lighter blue parishes do have some nesting as well. And this is how many whooping cranes are out in the world. This is also one that's going to be updated sometime soon. Um, so we are expecting that number to hopefully go up for sure. Um, so there are about 830 whooping cranes in the wild right now, or in the world, excuse me. Um, there are about 135 that are in captivity, so those are the ones that might be um, in other zoos, other facilities, or the ones that are helping us with this breeding program that we have going on. Um, the Aransas Wood Buffalo Migratory Population, which is one of the uh, historic ones out there that will be breeding in Wood Buffalo National Park in Canada and migrating down into Texas at Aransas National Wildlife Refuge. There's about 550 of those individuals. Moving into the ones that have been reintroduced, um, our eastern migratory population, which has been introduced into Wisconsin, and those guys will stay in Wisconsin and then migrate down to Florida. There is about 80 of those guys in the population now. And our Louisiana non-migratory population has 81 so far, 
and then Florida's non-migratory population has about six. So we will have some more updates for those as the years go on, and we're definitely hoping those numbers will continue to climb. We're seeing really good progress so far. That's what we really want. So what do you want to do if you see a woman crane out there? What should you do to see a woman crane? Um, so we do ask people, um, make sure you're mindful of where you are. Um, don't get too close. It might just deter them, uh, might make them really distressed. Uh, we want these guys to be as comfortable as possible. So try to maintain about 200 yards uh, away from a whooping crane when you see them. Um, if they are on that private property, because we know they do love those crawfish fields, they do love those agricultural fields, we just ask that you respect uh, that area. Because it is private, it does belong to some of those farmers, so we don't want to impede on them as well. If you do see someone who might be too close to a crane, might be harassing a crane, or even trying to poach or shoot that crane, um, there is a number uh, on that screen that will direct you to the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries and their law enforcement uh, department. And we also have some ID cards you guys can check out later that's got that number on there. Um, so you can report that to them as well. They do ask that you don't share any location information with anyone unless it is um, Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. Um, and you can report your sightings to Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries at our site below. It's called banditcranes.com. And there's going to be a link on that website where you can specify that it's a Louisiana bird. And they might ask you, is the bird banded? They have bird, uh, bands on either way. Um, if you couldn't see that, that's totally fine. You can mention that too. Um, and you can say where you were located when you saw that bird. Now, a couple other things that you guys can do to help out our whooping cranes. We've already done one today. is coming to this talk, learning more about our cranes. Um, but make sure you tell your family and friends about them. Talk about how many we have in the population, how these guys are coming back from that brink of extinction, um, and how there are no longer 20 and less than 20 in the wild now. Um, also support more wetland conservation. Um, come to events that a lot of the wetland conservation organizations are having. Um, learn some more about the wildlife that we have out there, about the ecosystem. Uh, and go on some hikes, go birding, take your friends as well. Uh, make sure you also support our local Louisiana crawfish and rice farmers. Buy local for sure. I know we all want some crawfish this season, so I'm excited for that myself too. <laughs> so make sure we support our local farmers. Um, and if you guys want to follow us on social media, keep up to date on all of our whooping cranes that we have um, with the International Crane Foundation, as well as our partners, uh, make sure to follow us on those social media accounts. Um, and we'll also tell you what events that we have going on. But thank you guys so much. We really appreciate you for coming out. Uh, I think we'll open that up for questions. Uh, so 
it's funny you say that. I used to work with several bird species that are very similar to this. So I worked with African penguins before, um, and they do a similar thing where it's, they will lay two eggs in the nest. Um, they will usually hatch both of those eggs, but only one of the chicks usually survive because it is a lot of work and energy to raise a chick. Um, they're not only getting food for themselves, the parents, you know, the mom and dad are getting food for themselves, but they're also getting it uh, for those chicks. Um, so it is definitely a lot of work. That's one thing that I kind of like to say a lot too. Um, and we see it, we see it pretty recently in those birds. Do you have anything to add on that as well? A little bit. Um, so, yeah, everything you said is right. Uh, some years are just really good years, and there might be more resources or less predators for whatever reason, and they'll have more chicks that'll pledge. Um, so last year, in 20, well, in 2022, we had 11 sets of twins pledge out of Canada and come down to Texas, which was the highest I think we had ever seen. Um, and we have had three sets of twins over the length of the Louisiana project survive, but it is rare. It just depends on predation, resources, and yeah, the ability of the parents to be good parents. Well, thank you guys so much. We do have a table over there with some more information. Um, you can check out our crane puppet if you'd like to. There's a lot of stuff on the table. Um, so if you want to come talk to us over there or take any stickers that we have, you're more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you.